So good, good evening, everyone. This is Will Taylor, and tonight I have the pleasure of being able to introduce Manfred Miller. Um, Manfred is a German-born homeopath uh, living in the U.S. presently, who began homeopathic studies back in 1979 and and um, opened up a full-time homeopathic practice around 1986. Um, around 1991, he began to experiment with antidoting the effects of vaccines and drugs. Um, as well as using the Q, um, uh, LM potencies. Over the past 10 years, he's developed the methods developed that will be presented in today's webinar. Um, Manfred's a regular guest lecturer on homeopathy with the program on integrative medicine at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill, North Carolina School of Medicine, where he's presented cured cases since um, 1995. He's published more than 20 papers on homeopathy and is currently writing several books, which I'm anxiously waiting for, including a homeopathic oncology, Materia Medica, an organon review, uh, more or less a clip, cliff notes for the organon, and a book called Healing Miracles. Manfred's been president of the North American Society of Homeopaths since 2005. Now, tonight, um, if you could uh, be texting in your questions using the, the text um, uh, field here in, in the uh, control panel of the GoToWebinar um, uh, software. I'm going to forward, uh, uh, field these, and toward the end of the presentation, we'll be able to ask some of these questions of Manfred and, and get responses to help make this a little more interactive. So I I'm going to go silent now and turn over the presentation to Manfred. And welcome. Uh, thank you, uh, Will, for uh, the introductions. Um, um, and thank you all for joining me for the Mueller Method digging deeper into your homeopathic toolbox. This method is, is what you get when the sixth edition of Hahnemann's Organon, modern for its time, meets current scientific research and treats today's chronic disorders. The world has changed since the simple horse and buggy days of Hahnemann's time, and so our approach to homeopathic treatment must become just as dynamic and accelerated. As the world has become more complex, more technologically and scientifically advanced, so have the diseases and disorders we suffer uh, from become more complicated and more aggressive. By identifying and removing obstacles to cure, by using homeopathic remedies to antidote the effects of past exposures, by reversing multiple disorders, by having a better understanding of potency and dose selection, and by addressing the predisposition to cancer, you will have all the updated tools necessary to tackle 90% of the patients that walk through your door. Your success rate will increase. Healing will progress at a faster pace. Your attrition rate will decrease, and you will thrive in your practice. You will use homeopathy to its fullest extent the way homeopathy was meant to be used. So let's get started. Why the Mueller Method? When I was first studying homeopathy, I learned the prevalent one-dose, wait-and-watch constitutional approach. And I practiced this way for the first few years. I had some good success, and I had some substantial failures. It was the failures that concerned me. I gradually realized that the homeopathy I was practicing, and some of the best teachers of homeopathy were practicing, was not yielding the same level of clinical improvement as those, those published 100 years ago. I delved deeper into the homeopathic literature, the older journals, and especially Hahnemann's writings. I realized that we homeopaths today were not applying to our modern situation some of the basic principles of healing Hahnemann had developed already 200 years ago. We were not utilizing all the tools in our toolbox. I came up with a completely revised method of practicing Hahnemannian homeopathy. After 20 years of research and clinical verification, I'm ready to present to you the Mueller Method. You know, we homeopaths can learn much from scientific research. Take, for example, learning that in the United States today, the atrogenic diseases are by far the number one cause of death. Uh, this is Null et al., 2011. Do you know what iatrogenic means? It literally means doctor-induced or induced by external influences, um, medical influences, in other words. Hahnemann saw this coming over 200 years ago. While he himself encountered mostly natural disorders, 
He saw that drugs are more powerful than natural diseases and can, can have more devastating effects. I'm going to read this quote for you. But artificial pathogenetic forces we call drugs are quite a different matter. Every drug can at all times and in all cases affect every living being and bring about its specific effects in him, even clearly perceptible ones if the dose is large enough. It follows that every living organism can at all time and without exception be affected as it were inf infected by a drug disorder. As I have said, this is not at all the case with natural diseases. Hahnemann saw that every drug once taken leaves a footprint in the individual's health that didn't stop once the drug had left the individual system. Pharmaceutical drugs, surgeries, vaccines, medical procedures, and massive, massive diagnostic imaging are doing us in fast. They are the number one cause of death and the most common cause of chronic disorders today. Hahnemann was pessimistic as to your, their cure. I quote, the ruination of human health by the allopathic non-healing art, more particularly in recent times, are of all chronic diseases, the most deplorable and the most incurable. I regret, regret to add that when they have reached any considerable severity, it is probably impossible to find or discover any methods for their cure. Have you ever had a situation where you knew the remedy but the patient did not improve, like I did with a case of a 30-something year old woman with eczema all over her body? She was worse from heat, had flaking of skin, had itching and scratching her skin until it bled. Every time she took the remedy sulfur, she had a massive aggravation of symptoms and never improved. She finally had to discontinue the treatment. What was going on here? This and several other cases brought me face to face with what happens when you don't remove the cause. Removing the cause is such a basic clinical principle that Hahnemann put it right in the first several aphorisms of the organon. But how often do we forget this? In our case, Upon taking a more careful case, I found out an Im important fact in the environment of the patient. She was exposed to sulfur on a daily basis from her well water. She drank, cooked with, and bathed in sulfur water daily. Before you can treat for the effects of something, you need to remove the causes. It's that simple. Once the patient moved from her home to a place with no detectable sulfur in the water, I was able to effect a total and permanent cure of the eczema using sulfur in ascending Q potencies. Of course, uh, I will talk more about Q potencies later. This gets me to tool number one, removing the causes of disease. In each case, we need to discover the sustaining causes. How do we do this? The easy way is by educating ourselves on some of the most prevalent causes of disease. I'm going to zero in now on two very common and very important causes of today's chronic dis disorders that are unfortunately often overlooked. The heavy metal mercury and pulsed high frequency microwave radiation used in telecommunications and including include some interaction between the two causes. Have you ever had clients with pains and restlessness in their legs that start after sundown and last till dawn? Have you seen clients who grind their teeth or who, dro who drool at night? Have you seen clients who are so sensitive in their mouths they cannot eat certain textures of foods or swallow pills? Have you worked with children that behave like they're crazy, pulling other children's hair or noses? Have you treated people with recurrent yeast and other infections? Then you have seen patients poisoned by mercury. Mercury is found in those silver dental amalgam fillings. It is in the form of the marisol and vaccines. It is contained in medical drugs and in foods, mostly fish and seafood, and in cosmetics, such as also hair coloring agents. It is a waste product from many industries that dump it right into our soil and groundwater. By the way, the industry most responsible for this is the dental industry. It is also passed through the placenta. Mercury is passed through the, through the placenta and through the breast milk. 
there is no safe dose of mercury. Some are more susceptible than others. These are the ones that cannot metabolize mercury. 90% um, of patients who have a cancer diathesis cannot metabolize mercury. And uh, we'll talk a little bit about the cancer diathesis, which was identified in the late 19th century by homeopaths. For example, studies show mercury invades the vital organs and the nervous system within two weeks of pl placing even just one dental amalgam filling. Vimy Lorchider, 1994, um, is the study. Even if you have your amalgams fillings, fillings replaced within years of active chelation for it, that mercury still, will still be in your system 20 years, uh, excuse me, I meant to say without years of act, active, active chelation, that mercury will still be in your system 20 years later. Mercury removal is vitally important when you treat chronic disorders. Most chronic disorders are caused or sustained by the presence of mercury in the body. What these disorders are and how to address it is described in my tutorials, Modern Mercurialism and Chronic Mercury Toxicity. I will now mention the next cause. Have you seen more and more people in the prime of their life with memory loss, lack of comprehension, or early sign of dementia? Have you seen young people in their 20s who lose their hair? Have you seen people in their 30s and 40s who had a stroke? Are you seeing more and more people complaining of tiredness and fatigue? Have you worked with families of children with brain tumors? Have you seen glaucoma and cataracts in patients younger than 50? If you haven't yet, you will soon. In modern societies, everyone is now continuously exposed to microwave radiation from cell phones, cordless phones, cell towers, smart meters, wireless telecommunication devices, including satellites. The insidious exposure to these pervasive frequencies is silent and invisible, and it causes serious harm over time. Its effects are not to be ignored. The studies are out there. Unfortunately, research on microwaves used in telecommunication has a media blackout imposed on in the United States, meaning people won't find out about it through the mainstream. It is up to you to research it and educate yourself and your clients about its health effects, really adverse effects on your health. One tip I'll give you, removing all wireless technology from your immediate environment or your clients and media immediate environments will go a long ways towards improving your and their health. And remember, to use the tautopathic antidotes, and we'll talk more about what that is later, to finish the disorders they have created. But more on that in the next section. Mercury acts as an antenna in the body when you're exposed to microwave or RF radi radiation. This means that mercury amplifies the effect of the latter. In my, in my experience, those suffering from EH, electromagnetic hypersensitivity, are always found to have large amount, amounts of mercury in their system. 19th century homeopath John Henry Clark knew about this. Here is a quotation from his Materia Medica under the remedy Mercurius. Quote, and it turns those who are under its influence into weather glasses and thermometers likewise. An electrician who at one time was required to work with his hands frequently in a trough filled with quicksilver thereafter could not bear the slightest shock of electricity, though, before he could stand very strong ones. This is one of the first description of the state of electromagnetic hypersensitivity. This gets me to our next tool. After eliminating the causes, you can begin to treat for the effects. And how are we doing that? After leaving the house with the sulfur in the well water, the patient with eczema received the remedy sulfur in daily Q potency. This was the remedy indicated on the basis of her symptoms, and it was the remedy for the cause. The potentized sulfur antidoted the effects of sulfur and cured the eczema. Hahnemann talked about using the similimum in this context of using sorinum for sora in the book Chronic Diseases. He acknowledged that the potency of a causative substance 
was the sim similum to the substance. We can use the potency of any toxin, drug, or even any type of radiation to counteract the secondary effects of the respective pathogenic agent. That this works is even supported by modern experimental studies. By the way, I credit nobody but Hahnemann for the brilliant insight into how and to antidote artificial disorders. Quote, not long ago, doctors tried to remove these hurt, 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 hurtful substances, commercial and pharmaceutical poisons, producing injuries and diseases, biometics, diluent drinks and purgatives, even with very, often with very unhappy results. They operated under the erroneous assumption that these drugs oppressed the stomach and bowels in a primary mechanical function. In reality, they changed the whole system in a peculiar to a still unknown ma manner. Their effects can never be cured like more, mere local mechanical irritations, as was formerly imagined. However, we now know how to combat many of these drug-induced disorder. The secondary action of poisonous drugs brings about diseases of a dynamic nature. This class of diseases must be contracted by the appropriate dynamic antidotes. There you have it. These secondary effects Hahnemann talks about that develop as a result of drugs and poisons are derangement in the biomagnetic regulatory system, the vital force. This derangement is the energetic drug disease, and it can be resolved by antidoting it with a potentized energetic remedy. Why is this important? Because there are also physiological effects, so-called primary effects from drugs. These last as long in the body, last as long in the body as, as, as the body is under their influence. The secondary effects, however, last longer. How do we antidote the primary effects? Coming back to our eczema case, why could we not antidote the sulfur from the well water with potentized sulfur to resolve the eczema? Well, because the primary cause of sulfur from the well water was still influencing the body and caused the primary effects. This is an important principle to understand. While a physiological cause, a crude drug, a toxin or radiation still affects the organism, while it is present in the system, we are dealing with its primary effects. Earlier, I mentioned mercury. How do we treat it while it is still there? We can contract it for the potentized remedy but never with the similimum, because the tautopathic pharmacode, the pharmacode comes from the Greek pharmakon. Pharmakon in Greek meant poison and drug. They were smart, weren't they, those Greeks? So the tautopathic pharmac pharmacode or potency of the drug should not be used to counteract the primary effect. Why not? Because it will aggravate, as it did in the case of eczema. Now, there have been studies that show that mercury was counteracted in mice uh, that were poisoned with mercury. It, it actually helped excrete it, but we have no idea how these mice felt while this was done. This has also been done with uh, arsenic. Um, the, the fact is, I've seen multiple cases, examples where people attempted to do this, and very often uh, did they aggravate the symptoms of the patient. After studying the effects of mercury during a class, one of my students decided she had chronic mercury poisoning, and without first checking with me, she took mercurious solubilis in a 1M potency. She developed a terrible tetry rash all over her body, a known mercury symptom. Why did this happen? Because she had mercury in her system. The solution? She could have taken crude hepersulfurous calcarium as Hahnemann used it. Since this is not available today, I have found that repeated doses of heparosulfurous in a very low decimal potency, such as the 2x or 3x, is quite helpful to counteract the symptoms of crude mercury. So much for the similimum in high potency. Also, standard physiologic antidotes should be used to neutralize the poison, old and new. One good source is Samuel Lilienthal's homeopathic therapeutics for instruction on how to antidote the primary action of various poisons, which are surprisingly, surprisingly practical and easily done, as well as effective. Um, let's talk a little bit about antidoting the secondary effect. As we have seen, Hahnemann advocated that we need to antidote the dynamic or secondary residual effects of the drug, and that those are the real iatrogenic diseases. The secondary action of a drug is actually the defensive or adaptive response produced by the body to the drug or toxin. 
it can last for years, especially if it has been suppressed or interfered with by a new suppressive drug. These strong long-term drug effects are the, are the disorders that are the most acidous because we don't often see them. They're latent because they're suppressed. They can be induced by a single dose of a suppressive drug in susceptible individuals. I've had hundreds of cases like this. To antidote, the long-term dynamic effects are secondary effects of exposures we can use the tautopathic drug or pharmacode safely without aggravation. As I have referred to, um, I, I, I tend to call it pharmacode because I like that expression. It's sort of like no so, but it is specifically for drugs made out of made from poisons and from um, from uh, medical drugs, but also other exposures. So recreational drugs, for example, that can leave secondary effects. Let me sum up. Once again, the primary effect of drug and poisons can be A, antidoted safely with physiological antidotes, or B, well, more or less safely anyway, or B, with potentized homeopathic antidotes, meaning they're made, uh, they're made from a similar substance and they have been shown by experience to be appropriate. Um, the uh, secondary effect of drugs or poisons can be used um, we can use the pharmacode, which is the potency of the poison or drug, or the potentized homeopathic antidote again. Uh, by the way, potentized homeopathic antidote can be found in our material medic under relations. I'd rather it be called interactions. That's what I call it in my oncology material medic. Now, suppose you decided to use Thuja to antidote a vaccine. To your surprise, rather than getting better, the young patient gets worse. What happened here? The child was given Tylenol to counteract the adverse reaction because, um, because of the vaccine sometimes causes fevers and other problems. So by giving Tylenol 30C first, you can remove the obstacle to cure first and then follow up with a potentized Thuja. You can avoid the aggravation and quickly affect the cure. By the way, Thuja suits best the vaccination called smallpox vaccine. It does not really suit many of our modern vaccines. We can't just use 19th century antidotes that worked in the 19th century and hope to succeed in the 20th century. The, today's vaccines are very different. Here's another example. The little girl had asthma. She was clingy, whiny, anxious, and felt better in the open air. Clearly, a pulsatilicate. She had pulsatilla, did nothing. But I antidoted the albuterol that her mother had been treating her with previously using albuterol 30C, then repeated the pulsatilla, and it acted quickly. The attack, attack stopped promptly. So how can we translate these experiences and into our practice? Read what homeopath Erastus Case has already said more than 100 years ago in his book on sarcoma. I'm not going to read all of the quotes. Uh, we are running a little short on time. I would like to give you an example of what, the, what this looks like in a chronic case. A real life, life case from my practice is an excellent examine, example on how layers upon layers of iatrogenic disease exist in patients and cause the current problem and also how to solve this. During the history taken, we elicited the following. Dolly is a 55-year-old female who has hot flashes. Her OBGYN prescribes Tremoran, conjugated estrogen. The next year, she develops hypertension. Her general practitioner prescribes uh, Tenolol. Six months later, an arrhythmia develops, and a cardiologist prescribes Cardizan for her new heart condition. Within eight months, she becomes clinically depressed and can hardly make it through the day. A psychiatrist prescribes, prescribes Zoloft for a psychiatric problem. When the panic attacks begin four days later, she sh the shrink adds Paxil to the list, and, and so on. At this point, she's had enough and seeks out my services. And this is all too typical. Where do you find the drug effects? Well, there are several ways, and we use a combination of them. Use a search engine, type in the drug name and side effects. Bring uh, buy, buy your own copy of the physician's desk reference. They're updated each year. Uh, this huge tome 
that uh, you can use to uh, do uh, weightlifting exercises. Um, these are cheap, available in use sometimes in used bookstores. And also, um, excellent websites are drugs.com or xlist.com and others. I use them constantly. Most drugs have numerous names. Sometimes you will have to do a little digging. You have to put in synonym, and then you might get other names, and that'll help you find the drug you're looking for. Um, in my practice, we have accumulated over 600 pharma codes um, to counteract medical drugs. So here's some homework for you. Start with the first drug of the case we've just mentioned and look up the side effects. You'll find high blood pressure is a well-known side effect of Premarin. Likewise, arrhythmia is a side effect of Atenolol, depression a side effect of Cardizem, and panic attacks a side effect of Zola. The side effects are the effects of the drug. Uh, it's the pathogenetic uh, proving, basically, that's done on unsuspecting patients. And some of it makes it into the scientific literature. And that is iatrogenesis at work. So how do we proceed in a case like this? We reverse her, her multiple drug disorders in according with Herring's law, beginning with the most recent and the most serious first, and the oldest and the mildest disorder last. That's she's what she started with. Her uh, hormonal problems. In Dolly's case, we started with the removal of the most recent drug, Paxil, and cleared for its effect using a 30C potency. We can continued in this fashion until each drug had been removed and antidoted. In the end, what was left was only her underlying hormonal imbalance. We also started her on daily doses of ascending Q potencies, changing every 10 days. For the next two months, while still on a nature mariaticum, we systematically, going back in time, antidoted her previous medications, x-rays, MRIs, and vaccines. Then, after we had antidoted everything, she uh, got carcinosinum in ascending Q, Q potencies before bedtime, also beginning, beginning with the one Q potencies and uh, changing every 10 days to a higher potency. In alternation with nature mariaticum, this was to address the known cancer diathesis. In 18 months, she was a new woman. See how we reversed her iatrogenic disorders? Why? Why do we do this? If I had gotten, given her a constitutional remedy at the first consultation, what do you think would have happened? Especially if I had used the high potency. She could have ended up in the ER. Happens all the time. That would not be a gentle or rapid cure. I've seen or heard of clients, patients of other homeopaths who ended up in the ICU. After one single dose of a homeopathic remedy, I heard of one recently, got nature mariaticum 200C and ended up having a kidney failure within a week. She did not have kidney failure before the nature mariaticum, but she did have it a week later. That is not acceptable. That would not be a gentle and rapid cure, as Hahnemann starts out the organ on. I know of many examples when things like this have happened. I know even of deaths induced by homeopathic treatment, unfortunately. Why does this happen? Because these remedies are dissimilar to the present drug disorders. Look at what the Rastus case says up, up here. Remove the most recent disorders first. <clears throat> And then when a high C potency uh, is given, this uh, is even more serious. These constitutional remedies reach very deep into the inherited layers. And what you're dealing with is just an acquired recent layer. Why would we want to stir up these old layers when all you need to do is gently remove the most recent layer? So that's why I call this high potency constitutional approach the sledgehammer approach. Remember, sledgehammers can sometimes kill. What we can learn from these examples, what can we learn from them? When we clear the secondary effects of multiple drugs or poisons, we need to do this in reverse order, with the most recent drug first, followed by the second most recent, etc. In this way, we can avoid aggravation. This is our next principle of antidoting. For the, for the mo for more information on the systematic approach of clearing all the effects in artificial disorders in a patient's history with their respective 
pharma codes. I refer you to my tutorial, Reverse Chronological Tutopathy. The next tool, tool number four, is potency. Have you ever had cases when you've been on, under home, that have been under homeopathic treatment for 10 years, sometimes by well-known homeopaths? Have you seen improvements? Uh, they have seen improvements, but they're stuck on several disorders that never got better. When you inquire, they were given excellent remedies. But when you ask them how often they had, had their remedies, because these remedies should have covered the whole case, they tell you they had a dose very few months. Uh, every few months, excuse me, sometimes they, did, they didn't see any improvements, and yet they waited months after coming to you, giving homeopathic treatment. Uh, um, um, they, they are surprised to find out that you give their daily doses, and they're, they're, uh, they're shocked when you tell them that you need to see them every three weeks. What I'm talking about here is accelerated homeopathic treatment, not, not 19th century horse and buggy treat, treatment. People come to me with stories of not sufficient improvement from well-chosen remedies by well-trained homeopath all the time. Our answer to this tool number four is the potency selection. Before we go into it and what potency can do for us, I would like to mention that Hahnemann carefully differentiated between potency and dose. The quote is, to be seen, uh, I'm not going to read it, um, potency, what this means is potency is determined by the number of succussions. The dose is the amount of the potency of a given, any given potency administered. Um, please supplement to this quote also what Anman says in, in um, uh, Aphorism 270 when he talks about diluting the dose. Uh, it will help. Uh, help us understand what follows. Um, Hahnemann saw that um, centesimal potencies were limited in their effect. Giving anything about 30 C, he said, was harmful. Um, repetition was a problem and harm sooner or later. So he had advised one single dose of that. That was, that was fourth edition organon prescribing. Um, D potencies are quick acting and short lasting. Uh, he, he was adamant that dry doses, like pellet doses, should never be repeated. When plussed in water, they could be repeated with caution. And the higher centesimal potencies should be avoided unless absolutely necessary and only in very healthy and very strong patients. I personally never used them. Um, doing this can protect you against causing casualties from homeopathic treatment. That's our second way to, to, prevent, to avoid uh, aggravation. Hahnemann saw the need for the repetition of the dose in chronic disorders. However, there was one problem. The centesimal potence could not be repeated with impunity. So he developed what he called the ideal potencies. The Q potencies, commonly called LM potencies, which is a misnomer. We don't want to go into this. Um, are deep acting and long lasting. They may be repeated as needed. They can easily alternate uh, with other remedies during the course of a day, so long as they're compatible and no inimical remedies are used. Given in water and moving to the next potent potencies after 10 doses or 10 days, whichever is first, you can go up in potency indefinitely. I can't go into the details here. I've talked about the, that at length. Another valuable benefit of treatment with daily doses of key potencies is that you can easily skip a few doses of remedies and treat for any acute that may arise and then resume treatment uh, with a chronic uh, potency again. In fact, you could continue to take the daily remedies in Q potencies and treat for the acute at the same time in alternation with acute potencies. Accelerated heal healing is possible with this method. Keep repeating this to yourself. Safe healing is possible with this method. And keeping in mind with Hahnemann's principle of the most rapid, the safe is the most prominent cure. This gets me to the next um, um, tool we can use, and that is the tool of the dose. Remember, Hahnemann did not think that the dose was simply the dilution of the potency. He said it is actually the amount given of the potency. That's something very difficult to find in the organon, but that's what it means. Hahnemann has left us with a tool of the dose. What do we need it for? Well, he says it in 270. 
for the individual sensitivity of the patients to be able to individualize the dose and adapt it to that sensitivity. So for example, he talked about the olfactory dose. You will find that people with a cancer diathesis almost always also are sensitive. They may be sensitive to poisons, they may be sensitive to radiation, electricity, or they may be sensitive to homeopathic remedies. The solution is individualization of the dose. Everybody needs to get the dose most beneficial to them. So, once you've decided on what potency to give and you start with your potency, you can also change the dose. I mentioned that I never use a dry pellet except if in an emergency situation like a wreck, an anaphylactic reaction, where you don't have the time to get the remedy mixed into water, but the remedy in general is given in water. There are several ways we can give the remedy, and here's a breakdown. The drop dose, either in the mouth or on the skin, that the skin is uh, very useful. I recently published a paper on uh, brain injuries and treatment. I had to use the haptic dose several times. Then the olfactory dose, the, uh, you might need to use this dose because some patients cannot take anything by mouth. So it's very effective to give it on the skin. Also the olfactory dose, um, sometimes you can give them a sniff dose. In hospitals it's a little tricky. Dosage cups, serial dilution taken, and then you take an olfactory dose of the further diluted remedy. Again, more of this is discussed in our tutorial, The Sensitive Patient. Another tool, number six, alternating our remedies. Have you ever seen patients that uh, present four or five chronic disorders completely unrelated to each other. Now, how would you know that? Well, you know it from the history. You know when the disorders started. Some of the disorders are the result of an accident. Another one is the disorders of a, 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 a result of a loss, a, a terrible grief happening in their life. Another one is the, the result of a uh, deterioration of an organ, et cetera, et cetera. So we do have multiple disorders in this case. There's no doubt about it. By the way, Hahnemann saw it that way. We, can, we could go into that. Unfortunately, we don't have the time for that. Why not address all the disorders at the same time by alternating remedy that cover the totality of symptoms of all four or five disorders? Remember, we did this in the case of Dolly. Um, sure, I could spend a whole lot of time spend, uh, spending time on remedies and try to find a remedy that covers all of the disorders. But even if I did, would I be more successful? And uh, in my experience, you are more successful if you find the remedies that best suit the totality of the symptoms of each disorder. Remember, the disorder is defined by its cause and by its symptoms. Um, this is not polypharmacy. This polypharmacy is the mixing of multiple substances or remedies into one concoction in one dose. Allopathic medicine does this. Uh, homeopathic treatment includes the tool of alternating remedies when two natural dissimilar disorders coexist in the same individual without affecting each other. Hahnemann talks about this, I think, in Aphorism 40, when he talks about two different miasm. Remember, he dealt with uh, natural disorders, infections, miasmic disorders. 90% of patients today suffer from the cancer diathesis or the predisposition to cancer. How do we know this? Well, from experience. I have written extensively about this. I've also done several tutorials on this. Those with a cancer disposition have an increased susceptibility to influences of all kinds. Physical and emotional, they can't just throw off influences. They are more susceptible and more sensitive than others in multiple areas. And 100% of sensitive patients show this predisposition, even though the sensitivity levels vary vastly. One of the tricky problems with identifying the predisposition to cancer, I, I've talked about this, and um, the cancer diathesis is a very big topic. I, don't, I have several tutorials on this, so we don't really have to go into it. Uh, there are opposing symptoms that uh, confuse people. Um, hypersensitivity versus lack of sensitivity, also a symptom of the cancer diathesis. Prone to infections or rarely ever sick, both is seen. The adventurous eater versus the picky eater, 
promiscuity versus aversion to sex, extroverted versus introverted personalities, early development and onset of puberty versus lack of development, um, um, or, or lack of maturity, uh, or rebellion versus conformity. These are some examples of how there is opposite and con conf uh, conflicting symptoms, all part of the di diathesis. Um, I propose that as homeopaths, we learn to identify this pariah in our health. The best uh, remedy to accomplish the, the cure of this is carcinocinum in my, uh, in my humble experience. Um, and how do we know it's cured? Well, simply because the symptoms and signs of it disappear. Um, daily doses of Q-potencies and ascending Q-potencies, I should say, is given and uh, that can be alternated with other indicated remedies. Carcinocenum should be added until um, all should be avoided, I should say, until uh, we have completely uh, removed any acquired disorders that includes iatrogenic disorders. Otherwise, if you start with carcinocenum, you will stir up a problem. Um, this is especially a problem when you're treating uh, cancer. You don't want to stir up a problem when you're treating serious illnesses. So um, to avoid this completely and safely move a, a, a case towards cure is simply avoid all of this until you're really dealing with the original inherited problem, and that is your cancer diathesis. So, uh, so um, I would like to summarize the protocol here. What do we do with a case? We start uh, our case stating by going or letting the, the patient or client go into their chief complaints. We, um, you know, get the full full symptoms for their history, their how did they start, and what was used to treat them. Then uh, we go into any additional complaints. We also go into a full history listing all health events from uh, in the reverse order from the most recent event first, going backwards in time all the way to birth. We also take a family history. We take the general symptoms of the patient and, and, and you know, as, as, as in classical homeopathy with heat and cold, craving and aversions, et cetera, to find out how this uh, patient system currently reacts. We look at particular symptoms. That means in all locations from head to toe. And we look at the mental symptoms, the personality characteristics and so far. All of that is important. But how do we analyze this? Very different. First of all, we want to identify the original disorders that existed and currently still exist. We also need to know how they have been suppressed with current drugs. We need to learn about how that is done and what effect it has. And uh, of course, we already have heard how to address it. Then the causative factors in the history other than drugs, emotional, social, environmental, even even uh, um, uh, uh, the, the old, the old uh, true natural disorders are still occasionally there. Uh, like gonorrhea, some people do get gonorrhea. They don't just suffer from a drug disorder. Um, what about uh, um, uh, things in the life of the patient, like events, like sudden traumatic events? Of course, they, they trigger some change in some people. And uh, then we need to do additional research on the known causes using the medical records and also the scientific literature. When we make our remedy selection, we select remedies for the chronic disorders. One for each disorder, again, disorder based on the, on the history and the cause, defined by the cause. And uh, we select the remedies we need to clear the effects and we need to then also develop a supportive protocol in some cases. Remember, you're going to deal with some pretty sick people. There are ways we can use symptomatic remedies. And also, uh, then we may want to detox for something like mercury. We've discussed all of this in detail in uh, our tutorial. So please feel free to uh, consult with those tutorials. The Mueller method can dramatically improve your success as a homeopath. By using the whole toolbox, it assures consistent clinical success. Please study our tutorials and our written material on this. 
If you need further instruction or if you need help with a case, I am available for private consultations, in which case you can contact my office and schedule a time. We will now have time for questions. Thank you. Um, and I've got a bunch of great questions in. If you, um, if any of you have others, uh, feel free to text them in and I'll check them out as we go with these. Um, for, first, um, let me pull these in. How, how would you compare and contrast your approach, uh, Manfred, with, with John Elminger's um, sequential therapy and its current incarnation as, as promoted by, by Rudy Verspohr? I don't know enough about it that I can't even answer that question. I've had this question before and I've since uh, gone back and I once picked up a book when I heard Rudy in a, in a conference, I believe in Baltimore it was, uh, he gave a lecture. I did not really fully understand what he was doing. I, do, I understand he was using high potencies. I uh, don't know if he, if he was familiar with some of the principles I'm talking about in this um, lecture here. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Um, um, let's see. Joy Joy had a had a uh, rhetorical comment first that it, it's it's funny to recommend removing wireless devices on a webinar that most of us are receiving wirelessly. <laughs> but she has, I'm she, on a wire, by the way. <laughs> but she goes on to ask uh, practically, what does removal mean? Um, using shields or what? I think recognizing that most of us live within a quarter mile of at least two. Um, uh, broadcast or relay stations um, for, for wireless. Well, there are different uh, expert advice uh, for, for shielding devices. It's extremely expensive to change your home and uh, make architectural uh, alterations. Um, it's true. You, you can't escape it. Um, I mentioned satellites. How are you going to escape satellites? I do think that you should do what you can. And I think what you can do is remove the uh, most direct exposure, which is uh, from your devices, the cell phone, uh, the antenna of your computer. Never use them. I never use them. I haven't used them in the last uh, 10 years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you can all, in addition, you can do, use some of the, the shielding uh, materials. I have a client who did this. She had some money and she already had a, a metal roof, which seal, shields her from satellite. If, it, if it's grounded, but then she added um, aluminum siding and aluminum screens and uh, she was in her home and uh, um, client of hers came to the home and she had, uh, she had, she, she, uh, she was trying to use the client, she was trying to use her cell phone and she found she did not have reception to her surprise. Okay. So yes, you can shield. Okay. So, so let me, um, in, interpret this question a little bit and elaborate a bit. Um, in in a you know a complex presentation where there there are multiple expressions in in the case, um, how do you determine that you're dealing with a collection of different diseases coexisting, that some expressions belong to one disease, some to another? Um, uh, I think the question is rather than just trivially um, assigning those at at some whim, how how, how would you make that determination? Well, gradually with experience, you uh, see that um, certain uh, certain uh, events in a person's health take on certain forms, and uh, you um, we have some a lot of help with uh, uh, ailments from in uh, in our repertory and also in our materia medica. Often we we find that that surprisingly um, other homeopaths have been there, and they have uh, um, seen that certain. Uh, events and causes um, are addressed better with certain remedies. In addition to that, of course, uh, you can address it by the symptoms. If you can identify that symptoms have persisted since a certain event, let's say um, after a uh, disease, a disorder, a natural disease, uh, sometimes people have leftover symptoms. Uh, then again, after a certain uh, emotional experiences, people have traumatic experience. Suddenly, they have problems, and of course, um, um, those problems, um, you know, uh, uh, are not always very clear cut. Just related to that, you can't be a hundred percent sure, but you don't have to be. Is a good thing. All you have to do is cover uh, the syndrome that started at a certain point and is still here. Here's a, a question. Um, 
And let me expand on it a little bit. They asked, how do you clear each antibiotic and maybe just extend that to each each drug um, that someone's taken historically? Many, many people have no idea what they've been given. Correct. And that, uh, that you do the best you can. You try to get records. You try to get... Um, I, f I found many times we start with the most recent. Most people still remember those. And uh, once you get to the most recent, all of a sudden their memory improves. All of a sudden, they remember entire events in their lives that they didn't share with you in the, in the initial consultation. And then you realize that you have to still, you have to also remove something that they had not, and that they're now telling you about. Um, and, then, and then you can proceed after that. So it's a process. You go back in time. Um, uh, if you don't have any way of accessing what antibiotics they've received, we do have a, a I hate to say it, an antibiotic mix that sometimes is helpful. And uh, we don't know in each individual case what it does. Um, the fact is this is a systematic approach it's, that I call reverse chronological telepathy. When you do it, you dramatically reduce the um, adverse effects from treatment in comparison when you don't do it. Okay. And you increase the efficacy. That's as simple as it is. Okay. And, and Valerie asked, um, how, how would you determine in, in, a, in a case that you're seeing, how would you determine what might be primary and what might be secondary effects of an exposure? You have to look it up. Um, exposure do have primary effects, especially toxins. And um, the same thing is true about drugs. The dr primary effect, uh, not drug, is the therapeutic effect. In other words, uh, if you want to drop someone's blood pressure, that is the primary effect of the, of the drug. Unfortunately, sometimes the secondary effect, effect actually raises the blood pressure long term. So you're actually, by giving blood pressure medication, you often induce high blood pressure. <laughs> so you're really trying to, trying to cure the condition that's already there, and sometimes uh, the, in artificial, the drug reaction is actually exacerbating the chronic condition. This is true with every disorder. It's true with uh, asthma, with depression, with every chronic disorder. Hahnemann saw this. Um, De Debbie asked, um, what about patients that treat themselves by purchasing combination homeopathic remedies, um, um, both oral and, and creams to apply to the skin? And I think she's implying um, the possibility of iatrogenic um, difficulties related to those. I'm not sure I understand the question. Um, I, I think she's asking, do we see iatrogenic issues related to individuals who uh, self-treat uh, purchasing combination homeopathic remedies, um, oral or, or okay. homeopathic no, cream preparations topically? Mm -hmm. Yes, sometimes you do, although um, I had uh, a dramatic case of that uh, during, uh, and when I was practicing in Durham at the American Dance Festival, there was a, a dancer who uh, had a small, minor poison ivy reaction going while she was going jogging, and she purchased a uh, combination remedy from Whole Foods and took it and had a massive breakout. Um, as a result of the roost tox or, or maybe another one other ingredients of, of the medicine. Um, and to our surprise, um, um, uh, there was, there was no, nothing the nutritional manager at Whole Foods could do for her. So she called me and I suggested a, high, a, a potentized form of, ro of roost tox and uh, uh, gradually alleviate the reaction. Okay. She recovered over a day or two. Okay. Now, De Debbie asked um, two related questions. One is, is can we make um, potentized uh, pharmacodes ourselves um, from the drug sample or the patient, or should we purchase these from a pharmacy? And, and what pharmacies might we contact for telepathic remedies? And she mentions albuterol. Okay. <laughs> we should purchase them from a pharmacy. They're best equipped to make those for us. Um, uh, initially, I could only find them in England. Um, Ainsworth and uh, Helios both have them. Also, the Austrian pharmacy, Remedia, has pharmacodes. Um, however, that may be a little cumbersome for some people. I did myself uh, make the first, I made the first 200 or so pharmacodes myself, or, or some of my students made them. 
And so we had to learn about drugs and how to make them. And uh, uh, you know, they need to understand are they water soluble, are they fat soluble, and so forth. Do they need to be triturated and, and etc. So that takes some knowledge and also time. So uh, as a busy homeopath, you probably won't have the time. But there are homeopaths now um, that uh, um, that uh, have a relationship with pharmacies in the U.S. and are finding uh, some pharmacies that are making it. The problem is the FDA uh, regulations. Mm -hmm. uh, they they have to have a monograph for each drug they allow people to make, and uh, I'm um, I'm thinking they may be able to permit it on the basis of that this was a historical method of treatment going back to the 19th century, mm -hmm. and they could uh, allow it on that basis, but. We'll have to see how that works in the U.S. Uh, mm -hmm. Other countries are not as strict. Right, right. Um, pra Prabha notes um, and, and says, uh, um, we have medicines like Nexvamica or Pulsatilla, which are uh, often called universal antidotes. And if that were the case, what would be the need for individually neutralizing each medication? Um, yes, history. and believe me, there is. There's, in, there's very, very uh, um, little that those medicines antidote. They do antidote some things, but there are far, far more uh, iatrogenic disorders that are very specific, and they can only be antidoted by the exact drug uh, in potency. Um, there are many other uh, situations that have their specific homeopathic antidotes. You can study this under relations under every remedy. Um, there, and, and some of them have a, a, even their specifications listed. I feel Franz Vermeulen's uh, uh, Concordant Materiomatics currently the best uh, reference mm -hmm. to how to find the, the correct antidote for a specific condition. A couple questions, if I can kind of amalgamate them here a little bit. Um, um, in, in a patient who's using conventional medication um, and, and who's uh, uh, apparently dependent on it, or, or yes. um, and do we need to stop that before antidoting the, the absolutely the drug? remove the cause before you antidote mm -hmm. it and and how would one do that in a complex case where that they seem to be dependent on that um, well I know in in most cases these are frivolous medications uh, doctors are prescribing medications um, uh, simply because they have to prescribe something and and because maybe uh, also they profit from it um, there are so many unnecessary medications out there, and many of them, when you do the research, are prescribed even though they, there is a known adverse uh, interactions between the medications. And so many of the patients' complaints, why they're seeking help, is because they're reacting to the interaction of the medication. Um, so um, uh, I, I do, um, maybe I forgot to mention this, I do strongly recommend that this, that this be done with full cooperation of the physician who prescribed the medicine. In other words, if there is evidence from uh, from the um, uh, li literature that a, a, a drug effect is caused, uh, then um, then uh, if and a patient wishes to get off a medication, um, they should go to their doctor and say, "How do I get best get off the medication?" And of course, a lot of doctors will say, "Well, I can give you another medication for it," but in this case. If the patient is ed educated well enough, they can say, well, I prefer to use homeopathic treatment, um, and I'd like to get off this medication. And it should be done one at a time. It should be done with full knowledge of what you're doing. That mm -hmm. does, it does really take some experience. If we could do a few more questions, uh, but one before sure. people have to, have to, to leave. Um, you, yes. you've, mentioned, you've mentioned several tutorials that you have, and people wonder where to find those and if there's a cost associated with those. Yes, the tutorials are available. Some, many of them at Whole Health now, and they're also available on our website, uh, thehomeopathiccollege.org. Someone asked. They said that um, um, if ninety percent of the population has the cancer, di cancer diathesis, if a mother comes in with issues, is it safe to give carcinosinum during the course of the pregnancy? And I, 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 I'm wondering if they're talking about treating the mother or if they're asked, talking about treating the, the developing fetus um, uh, simultaneously. Um, so two questions there, I suppose. Good question, yes. A very good question. And and, uh, and uh, if it's the mother that we're talking about, yes, it is safe to give carcinosin. Um, in all, all uh, applying all of the principles that I have um, spoken about, because if you don't, then you run into trouble. 
uh, if it's the fetus, the same thing applies. It's good. Uh, both mother and fetus will be affected by the remedy the mother takes. And let's close out with one more. Uh, Joy asked if you've ever used Agent Orange. It's a totopathic remedy. And have you seen the need for it? I have multiple times. I was, I was recent, recently uh, working with a cancer, uh, a client with cancer who had uh, Agent Orange and who needed the Agent Orange. But then I discovered it was really the anthrax vaccine that causes cancer. And I found it in uh, herring in the guiding symptoms. He, um, and there's a, there's a swollen, swollen tumor on the right side in the parotid re region, and that's a symptom of anthrax. And that's what you often discover. The homeopath, you become an expert on, on uh, side effects from different uh, substances, drugs, vaccines, microbes, you name it, when you go through this uh, method. Because, um, you know, you can't know. Of course, I, I always call it a hypothesis until we have a cure. In other words, everything is a hypothesis. In each individual case, the way you proceed, your your your, your treatment plan, everything's a hypothesis until you see the effects. Well, thank you, Manfred. And a number of You're participants welcome. here have have um, have texted in their thanks as well. So thanks for sharing this okay. with us tonight, and uh, appreciate it to all. Um, this will be posted as a, a recording on the Whole Health Now um, site in the. Uh, in, in the free casts section um, to be readily accessible. And um, I think the uh, the reference to your website, yeah, homeopathiccollege.org is here on the slides. So um, folks can pull that off if they need to in the future as well. So thanks for taking the time tonight and sharing with us. And welcome. Uh, appreciate it. And thank you, Will. Okay. Terrific. Good night, all. Good night.